Jefferson F. Davis was an American soldier and politician, and was the President of the Confederate States of America during the American Civil War, 1861-1865. He took personal charge of the Confederate war plans but was unable to find a strategy to defeat the more populous and industrialized Union. His diplomatic efforts failed to gain recognition from any foreign country. At home he paid little attention to the collapsing Confederate economy. The government printed more and more paper money to cover the war's expenses, leading to runaway inflation and devaluation of the Confederate dollar. Davis was born in Kentucky to a moderately prosperous farmer and grew up on his brother's large cotton plantations in Mississippi and Louisiana. His brother Joseph secured his appointment to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. After he graduated he served six years as a lieutenant in the Army. He fought in the Mexisana euro american War as the colonel of a volunteer regiment. He served as the Secretary of War under Democratic President Franklin Pierce, and as a Democratic U.S. Senator from Mississippi. An operator of a large cotton plantation in Mississippi with over 100 slaves, he was well known for his support of slavery in the Senate. He argued against secession, but did agree that each state was sovereign and had an unquestionable right to secede from the Union. Davis lost his first wife to malaria after three months of marriage, and the disease almost killed him as well. He suffered from ill health for much of his life. He had six children with his second wife, but only two survived him. Many historians attribute the Confederacy's weaknesses to the leadership of President Davis. His preoccupation with detail, reluctance to delegate responsibility, lack of popular appeal, feuds with powerful state governors, favoritism toward old friends, inability to get along with people who disagreed with him, neglect of civil matters in favor of military ones, and resistance to public opinion all worked against him. Historians agree he was a much less effective war leader than his Union counterpart Abraham Lincoln. After Davis was captured in 1865, he was accused of treason but was not tried and was released after two years. While not disgraced, Davis had been displaced in ex-Confederate affection after the war by his leading general, Robert E. Lee. Davis wrote a memoir entitled The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, which he completed in 1881. By the late 1880s, he began to encourage reconciliation, telling Southerners to be loyal to the Union. Ex-Confederates came to appreciate his role as a Southern patriot and he became a hero of the lost cause in the New South. Early life and first military career, Davies' paternal grandparents, though they had not yet met, immigrated to North America from the region of Snowdonia in North Wales in the early 1700s. The rest of his ancestry can be traced to England and Scotland. After arriving in Philadelphia, Davies' paternal grandfather Evan settled in Georgia and married Lydia Emery Williams, who had two sons from a previous marriage. Samuel Emery Davis was born to them in 1756. He served in the Continental Army during the American Revolutionary War, along with his two older half-brothers. In 1783, after the war, he married Jane Cook. She was born in 1759 in Christian County, Kentucky, to William Cook and his wife Sarah Simpson. In 1793 the family relocated to Kentucky, establishing what is now the community of Fairview on the border of Christian and Todd counties. Samuel and Jane had ten children. Jefferson was the last and was born on June 3, 1807 or 1808, on the Davis homestead in Fairview. The year of his birth is uncertain. For many years Davis gave 1807, but he later settled upon 1808, then late in life switched back. Samuel had been a young man when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Jefferson was the third President of the United States, and Samuel, admiring him greatly, named his last son after the President. Abraham Lincoln was born a year or two later, less than 100 miles to the northeast in Hogenville, Kentucky. In the early 1900s, the Jefferson Davis State Historic Site was created near the site of Davis' birth. During Davis' youth, his family moved twice, in 1811 to St. Mary Parish, Louisiana, and less than a year later to Wilkinson County, Mississippi. 
three of Jefferson's older brothers served in the War of 1812. In 1813, Davies began his education at the Wilkinson Academy in the small town of Woodville, near the family cotton plantation. Two years later, Davis entered the Catholic School of St. Thomas at St. Rose Priory, a school operated by the Dominican Order in Washington County, Kentucky. At the time, he was the only Protestant student at the school. Davies returned to Mississippi, studying at Jefferson College at Washington in 1818. Three years later in 1821, he returned to Kentucky, where he studied at Transylvania University in Lexington. His father Samuel died on July 4, 1824, when Jefferson was 16 years old. Davis attended the United States Military Academy starting in late 1824. While there, he was placed under house arrest for his role in the Eggnog Riot during Christmas 1826. Whiskey was smuggled into the Academy for the purpose of making eggnog, and more than one-third of the cadets were involved. In June 1828 he graduated 23rd in a class of 33. Following graduation, 2nd Lieutenant Davis was assigned to the 1st Infantry Regiment and was stationed at Fort Crawford, Prairie du Cayenne, Wisconsin Territory. Zachary Taylor, a future President of the United States, had recently assumed command before Davis arrived in early 1829. In March 1832, Davis returned to Mississippi on furlough having had no leave since he first arrived at Fort Crawford. He was still in Mississippi during the Black Hawk War but returned to the fort in August. At the conclusion of the war, Colonel Taylor assigned him to escort Black Hawk to prison. Davis made an effort to shield Black Hawk from curiosity seekers, and the chief noted in his autobiography that Davis treated him with much kindness, and showed empathy for the leader's situation as a prisoner. First marriage and early career Davis fell in love with his commanding officer's daughter, Sarah Knox Taylor. Both Sarah and Jefferson sought Taylor's permission to marry. Taylor refused, as he did not wish his daughter to have a difficult life as a military wife on frontier army posts. Davis' own experience led him to appreciate the basis for Taylor's objection. He consulted with his older brother Joseph, and they both began to question the value of an army career. Davis hesitated to leave but his desire for Sarah overcame this, and he resigned his commission in a letter dated April 20, 1835. He had arranged for the letter to be sent to the War Department for him on May 12 when he did not return from leave. He had made no mention to Taylor of his intention to resign. Against his former commander's wishes, on June 17, he married Sarah in Louisville, Kentucky. His resignation became effective June 30. Davies' older brother Joseph had been very successful and owned Hurricane Plantation and 1,800 acres of adjoining land along the Mississippi River near Vicksburg, Mississippi. The adjoining land was known as Breerfield since it was largely covered with brush and briars. Joseph desired to have his youngest brother and his wife nearby and gave use of Breerfield to Jefferson, who eventually developed Breerfield Plantation there. Joseph, however, retained the title. In August 1835, Jefferson and Sarah traveled south to his sister Anna's home in West Feliciana Parish, Louisiana. The home was known as Locust Grove. Their goal was to spend the hot summer months in the countryside and away from the Flat River land, for their health, but both of them contracted either malaria or yellow fever. After three months of marriage, Sarah died at the age of 21 on September 15, 1835. Davies was also severely ill, and his family feared for his life. In the month following Sarah's death, he slowly improved, although he remained weak. In late 1835, Davies sailed from New Orleans to Havana, Cuba, to help restore his health. He was accompanied by James Pemberton, his only slave at that time. There Davies observed the Spanish military and sketched fortifications. Although no evidence points to his having any motive beyond general interest, the authorities knew that Davis was a former army officer and warned him to stop his observations. Bored, and feeling somewhat better, Davis booked passage on a ship to New York, then continued to Washington, D.C., where he visited his old schoolmate George Wallace Jones. He soon returned with Pemberton to Mississippi. 
For several years following Sarah's death, Davies was reclusive and honored her memory. He spent time clearing Brearfield and developing his plantation, studied government and history, and had private political discussions with his brother Joseph. By early 1836, Davies had purchased 16 slaves. He held 40 slaves by 1840, and 74 by 1845. Davies promoted Pemberton to be overseer of the field teams. In 1860 he owned 113 slaves. In 1840 Davis first became involved in politics when he attended a Democratic Party meeting in Vicksburg and, to his surprise, was chosen as a delegate to the party's state convention in Jackson. In 1842, he attended the Democratic convention, and in 1843 became a Warren County Whig candidate for the State House of Representatives. He lost his first election. In 1844, Davis was sent to the party convention for a third time, and his interest in politics deepened. He was selected as one of six presidential electors for the 1844 presidential election and campaigned effectively throughout Mississippi for the Democratic candidate James K. Polk. Second Marriage and Family In 1844, Davis met Varina Banks Howell, then 17 years old, whom his brother Joseph had invited for the Christmas season at Hurricane Plantation. She was a granddaughter of New Jersey Governor Richard Howell. Within a month of their meeting, the 35-year-old widower Davis had asked Varina to marry him, and they became engaged despite her parents' initial concerns about his age and politics. They were married on February 26, 1845. During this time Davis was persuaded to become a candidate for the United States House of Representatives and began canvassing for the election. In early October 1845 he traveled to Woodville to give a speech and arrived a day early to visit his mother there, only to find that she had died the day before. After the funeral he rode the 40 miles back to Natchez to deliver the news, then returned to Woodville again to deliver his speech. He won the election. Jefferson and Varina had six children. Three died before reaching adulthood. Samuel Emery, born July 30, 1852, was named after his grandfather. He died June 30, 1854, of an undiagnosed disease. Margaret Howell was born February 25, 1855, and was the only child to marry and raise a family. She married Joel Addison Hayes, J.R., and they had five children. They were married in St. Lazarus Church, nicknamed the Confederate Officers' Church, in Memphis, Tennessee. In the late 19th century, they moved from Memphis to Colorado Springs, Colorado. She died on July 18, 1909, at the age of 54. Jefferson Davis, J.R., was born January 16, 1857. He died of yellow fever at age 21 on October 16, 1878, during an epidemic in the Mississippi River Valley that caused 20,000 deaths. Joseph Evan, born on April 18, 1859, died at five years old as the result of an accidental fall on April 30, 1864. William Howell, born on December 6, 1861, was named for Varina's father. He died of diphtheria at age 10 on October 16, 1872. Varina Ann, known as Winnie, was born on June 27, 1864, several months after her brother Joseph's death. She never married after her parents refused to let her marry into a northern abolitionist family. She died on September 18, 1898, at age 34. Davies was plagued with poor health for most of his life. He experienced repeated bouts with malaria, was troubled with battle wounds from fighting in the Mexicana Euro American War and suffered from a chronic eye infection that made it impossible for him to endure bright light. He also had trigeminal neuralgia, a nerve disorder that causes severe pain in the face. It has been called one of the most painful known ailments. Wartime Colonel, in 1846 the Mexicana Euro-American War began. Davies resigned his house seat in early June and raised a volunteer regiment, the 155th Infantry Regiment becoming its colonel under the command of his former father-in-law, General Zachary Taylor. On July 21 the regiment sailed from New Orleans for Texas. Colonel Davis sought to arm his regiment with the M1841 Mississippi rifle. 
At this time, smoothbore muskets were still the primary infantry weapon, and any unit with rifles was considered special and designated as such. President James K. Polk had promised Davis the weapons if he would remain long enough for an important vote on the Walker Tariff. General Winfield Scott objected on the basis that the weapons were insufficiently tested. Davis insisted and called in his promise from Polk, and his regiment was armed with the rifles, making it particularly effective in combat. The regiment became known as the Mississippi Rifles because it was the first to be fully armed with these new weapons. The incident was the start of a lifelong feud between Davis and Scott. In September, Davis participated in the Battle of Monterey, during which he led a successful charge on the La Teneria Fort. On February 22, 1847, Davis fought bravely at the Battle of Buena Vista and was shot in the foot, being carried to safety by Robert H. Chilton. In recognition of Davis' bravery and initiative, Taylor is reputed to have said, My daughter, sir, was a better judge of men than I was. On May 17, President Polk offered Davis a federal commission as a brigadier general and command of a brigade of militia. Davis declined the appointment, arguing that the Constitution gives the power of appointing militia officers to the states, not the federal government. Return to Politics, Senator Honoring Davis' war service, Governor Brown of Mississippi appointed him to take the place of United States Senator Jesse Spate, who had died on May 1, 1847. Davis took his temporary seat on December 5, and in January 1848 he was elected to serve the remaining two years of the term. In December, during the 30th United States Congress, he was made a regent of the Smithsonian Institution and began serving on the Committee on Military Affairs and the Library Committee. In 1848, Senator Davis proposed and introduced an amendment to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that would have annexed most of northeastern Mexico, but it failed on a vote of 11 to 44. Regarding Cuba, Davis declared that it must be asked to increase the number of slaveholding constituencies. He also was concerned about the security implications of a Spanish holding lying a few miles off the coast of Florida. A group of Cuban revolutionaries led by Venezuelan adventurer Narciso La Cube de Pez intended to forcibly liberate Cuba from Spanish rule. Searching for a military leader for a filibuster expedition, they first offered command of the Cuban forces to General William J. Worth, but he died before making his decision. In the summer of 1849, La Cube de Pez visited Davis and asked him to lead the expedition. He offered an immediate payment of $100,000, plus the same amount when Cuba was liberated. Davis turned down the offer, stating that it was inconsistent with his duty as a senator. When asked to recommend someone else, Davis suggested Robert E. Lee, then an army major in Baltimore. La Cube de Pez approached Lee, who also declined on the grounds of his duty. The Senate made Davis chairman of the Committee on Military Affairs on December 3, 1849, during the first session of the 31st United States Congress. On December 29 he was elected to a full six-year term. Davis had not served a year when he resigned to run for the governorship of Mississippi on the issue of the Compromise of 1850, which he opposed. He was defeated by fellow Senator Henry Stewart Foote by 999 votes. Left without political office, Davis continued his political activity. He took part in a convention on states' rights, held at Jackson, Mississippi, in January 1852. In the weeks leading up to the presidential election of 1852, he campaigned in numerous southern states for Democratic candidates Franklin Pierce and William R. King. Secretary of War Franklin Pierce won the presidential election and in 1853 made Davies his Secretary of War. In this capacity, Davies began the Pacific Railroad surveys in order to determine various possible routes for the proposed transcontinental railroad. He promoted the Gadsden purchase of today's southern Arizona from Mexico, partly because it would provide an easier southern route for the new railroad. The Pierce administration agreed, and the land was purchased in December 1853. He saw the size of the regular army as insufficient to fulfill its mission, and maintained that salaries would have to be increased, something which had not occurred for 25 years. Congress agreed and increased the pay scale, 
and added four regiments which increased the army's size from about 11,000 to about 15,000. Davis also introduced general usage of the rifles that he had used successfully during the Mexisani Euro American War. As a result, both the morale and capability of the army was improved. He became involved in public works when Pierce gave him responsibility for construction of the Washington Aqueduct and an expansion of the U.S. Capitol, both of which he managed closely. The Pierce administration ended in 1857 after Pierce's loss of the Democratic nomination to James Buchanan. Davies' term was to end with Pierce's, so he ran for the Senate, was elected, and re-entered it on March 4, 1857. Returned to Senate, in the 1840s, tensions were growing between the North and South over various issues including slavery. The Wilmot Proviso, introduced in 1846, contributed to these tensions. If passed, it would have banned slavery in any land acquired from Mexico. The Compromise of 1850 brought a temporary respite, but the Dred Scott case, decided in 1857, spurred public debate. There was increasing talk of the South seceding from the Union. Devisa Euro unregistered trademark renewed service in the Senate was interrupted in early 1858 by an illness that began as a severe cold and which threatened him with the loss of his left eye. He was forced to remain in a darkened room for four weeks. He spent the summer of 1858 in Portland, Maine. On 4 July, Davis delivered an anti-secessionist speech on board a ship near Boston. He again urged the preservation of the Union on October 11th in Fanel Hall, Boston, and returned to the Senate soon after. As he explained in his memoir The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, he believed that each state was sovereign and had an unquestionable right to secede from the Union. At the same time, he counseled delay among his fellow Southerners, because he did not think that the North would permit the peaceable exercise of the right to secession. Having served as Secretary of War under President Pierce, he also knew that the South lacked the military and naval resources necessary to defend itself in a war. Following the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, however, events accelerated. South Carolina adopted an ordinance of secession on December 20, 1860, and Mississippi did so on January 9, 1861. Davies had expected this but waited until he received official notification. Then on January 21, the day Davies called the saddest day of my life, he delivered a farewell address to the United States Senate, resigned and returned to Mississippi. President of the Confederate States of America. Anticipating a call for his services since Mississippi had seceded, Davies had sent a telegraph message to Governor John J. Petters saying, Judge what Mississippi requires of me and place me accordingly. On January 23, 1861, Pettitus made Davis a major general of the Army of Mississippi. On February 9, a constitutional convention met at Montgomery, Alabama and considered Davis and Robert Toombs of Georgia as a possible president. Davis, who had widespread support from six of the seven states, easily won. He was seen as the champion of a slave society and embodied the values of the planter class, and was elected provisional Confederate president by acclamation. He was inaugurated on February 18, 1861. Alexander Stevens was chosen as vice president, but he and Davis feuded constantly. Davies was the first choice because of his strong political and military credentials. He wanted to serve as commander-in-chief of the Confederate armies but said he would serve wherever directed. His wife Farina later wrote that when he received word that he had been chosen as president, Reading that telegram he looked so grieved that I feared some evil had befallen our family. Several forts in Confederate territory remained in Union hands. Davies sent a commission to Washington with an offer to pay for any federal property on southern soil, as well as the southern portion of the national debt, but Lincoln refused to meet with the commissioners. Brief informal discussions did take place with Secretary of State William Swood through Supreme Court Justice John A. Campbell an Alabamian who had not yet resigned. Swood hinted that Fort Sumter would be evacuated, but gave no assurance. On March 1, 1861, Davies appointed General P.G.T. Beauregard to command all Confederate troops in the vicinity of Charleston, South Carolina, where state officials prepared to take possession of Fort Sumter. 
Beauregard was to prepare his forces but avoid an attack on the fort. Lincoln dispatched a small fleet of warships, troops, and transports from the Navy Yard in New York to resupply and reinforce Fort Pickens and Fort Sumter, although he told Davis they would not fire unless fired upon. They did arrive but were unable to help and just watched the action from ten miles out. Davis faced the most important decision of his career, to prevent reinforcement at Fort Sumter or to let it take place. He and his cabinet decided to demand that the federal garrison surrender and, if this was refused, to use military force to prevent reinforcement before the fleet arrived. Major Anderson did not surrender. Beauregard bombarded the fort on April 12. The Confederates launched an artillery attack on Fort Sumter until it surrendered. No one was killed in the artillery duel, but the attack on the U.S. fortress meant the fighting had started. President Lincoln called up state militia to march south to recapture federal property. In the North and South, massive rallies were held to demand immediate war. The Civil War had begun. At the start of the war, nearly 21 million people lived in the North compared to 9 million in the South. The North had vastly greater industrial capacity, built nearly all of the locomotives, steamships, and industrial machinery, and had a much larger and more integrated railroad system. Nearly all of the munitions facilities were in the North, while critical ingredients for gunpowder were in very short supply in the South. The Union had a large navy, whereas the new Confederacy had only a few captured warships a Euro the handful it built were failures. The Union blockade made imports via blockade runners difficult and expensive. When Virginia joined the Confederacy, Davis moved his government to Richmond in May 1861. He and his family took up his residence there at the White House of the Confederacy later that month. Having served since February as the provisional president, Davis was elected to a full six-year term on November 6, 1861 and was inaugurated on February 22, 1862. In June 1862, in his most successful move, Davis assigned General Robert E. Lee to replace the wounded Joseph E. Johnston in command of the Army of Northern Virginia, the main Confederate army in the Eastern Theater. That December he made a tour of Confederate armies in the west of the country. Davis had a very small circle of military advisors. He largely made the main strategic decisions on his own, though he had special respect for Lee's views. Given the Confederacy's limited resources compared with the Union, Davis decided that the Confederacy would have to fight mostly on the strategic defensive. He maintained a mostly defensive outlook throughout the war, paying special attention to the defense of his national capital at Richmond. He attempted strategic offensives when he felt that military success would both shake Northern self-confidence and strengthen the peace movements there. The campaigns met defeat at Antietam in Maryland and Gettysburg in Pennsylvania, as well as in Kentucky during the Confederate Heartland Offensive. Administration and Cabinet As provisional president in 1861, Davis formed his first cabinet. Robert Toombs of Georgia was the first Secretary of State and Christopher Meminger of South Carolina became Secretary of the Treasury. Leroy Pope Walker of Alabama was made Secretary of War after being recommended for this post by Clement Clay and William Yancey. John Reagan of Texas became Postmaster General. Judah P. Benjamin of Louisiana became Attorney General. Although Stephen Mallory was not put forward by the delegation from his state of Florida, Davis insisted that he was the best man for the job of Secretary of the Navy, and he was eventually confirmed. Since the Confederacy was founded, among other things, on states' rights, one important factor in Davis' choice of cabinet members was representation from the various states. He depended partly upon recommendations from congressmen and other prominent people. This helped maintain good relations between the executive and legislative branches. This also led to complaint as more states joined the Confederacy, however, because there were more states than cabinet positions. As the war progressed, this dissatisfaction increased and there were frequent changes to the cabinet. Toombs, who had wished to be president himself, was frustrated as an advisor and resigned within a few months of his appointment to join the army. Robert Hunter of Virginia replaced him as Secretary of State on July 25, 1861. On September 17, 
Walker resigned as Secretary of War due to a conflict with Davis, who had questioned his management of the War Department and had suggested he consider a different position. Walker requested, and was given, command of the troops in Alabama. Benjamin left the Attorney General position to replace him, and Thomas Bragg of North Carolina took Benjamin's place as Attorney General. Following the November 1861 election, Davies announced the permanent cabinet in March 1862. Benjamin moved again, to Secretary of State. George W. Randolph of Virginia had been made the Secretary of War. Mallory continued as Secretary of the Navy and Reagan as Postmaster General. Both kept their positions throughout the war. Meminga remained Secretary of the Treasury, while Thomas Hill Watts of Alabama was made Attorney General. In 1862 Randolph resigned from the War Department, and James Seddon of Virginia was appointed to replace him. In late 1863, Watts resigned as Attorney General to take office as the Governor of Alabama, and George Davis of North Carolina took his place. In 1864, Meminga withdrew from the Treasury post due to congressional opposition, and was replaced by George Trenham of South Carolina. In 1865, Congressional opposition likewise caused Sedum to withdraw, and he was replaced by John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky. Cotton was the South's primary export and the basis of its economy, and its production was dependent upon slave labor. At the outset of the Civil War, Davies realized that intervention from European powers would be vital if the Confederacy was to stand against the Union. The administration sent repeated delegations to European nations but several factors prevented Southern success in terms of foreign diplomacy. The Union blockade of the Confederacy led European powers to remain neutral, contrary to the Southern belief that a blockade would cut off the supply of cotton to Britain and other European nations and prompt them to intervene on behalf of the South. Many European countries objected to slavery. Britain had abolished it in the 1830s, and Lincoln a Euro unregistered trademark S Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 made support for the South even less appealing in Europe. Finally, as the war progressed and the South failed to win enough battles, foreign powers were not convinced that the Confederacy had the strength to become independent. In the end, not a single foreign nation recognized the Confederate States of America. Strategic Failures most historians sharply criticize Davis for his flawed military strategy, his selection of friends for military commands, and his neglect of home front crises. Until late in the war, he resisted efforts to appoint a general-in-chief, essentially handling those duties himself. On January 31, 1865, Lee assumed this role, but it was far too late. Davis insisted on a strategy of trying to defend all southern territory with ostensibly equal effort. This diluted the limited resources of the South and made it vulnerable to coordinated strategic thrusts by the Union into the vital Western theater. He made other controversial strategic choices, such as allowing Lee to invade the North in 1862 and 1863 while the Western armies were under very heavy pressure. Lee lost at Gettysburg, Vicksburg simultaneously fell, and the Union took control of the Mississippi River, splitting the Confederacy. At Vicksburg, the failure to coordinate multiple forces on both sides of the Mississippi River rested primarily on Davis' inability to create a harmonious departmental arrangement or to force such commanders as Generals Edmund Kirby Smith, Earl Van Dorn, and Theophilus H. Holmes to work together. Davis has been faulted for poor coordination and management of his generals. This includes his reluctance to resolve a dispute between Leonidas Polk, a personal friend, and Braxton Bragg who was defeated in important battles and distrusted by his subordinates. He did relieve the cautious but capable Joseph E. Johnston and replaced him with the reckless John Bell Hood, resulting in the loss of Atlanta and the eventual loss of an army. Davies gave speeches to soldiers and politicians but largely ignored the common people, who came to resent the favoritism shown the rich and powerful. Davis thus failed to harness Confederate nationalism. One historian speaks of the heavy-handed intervention of the Confederate government. Economic intervention, regulation, and state control of manpower, production and transport were much greater in the Confederacy than in the Union. Davies did not use his presidential pulpit to rally the people with stirring rhetoric. 
he called instead for people to be fatalistic and to die for their new country. Apart from two-month-long trips across the country where he met a few hundred people, Davies stayed in Richmond where few people saw him. Newspapers had limited circulation, and most Confederates had little favorable information about him. To finance the war, the Confederate government initially issued bonds, but investment from the public never met the demands. Taxes were lower than in the Union and were collected with less efficiency, and European investment was insufficient. As the war proceeded, both the Confederate government and the individual states printed more and more paper money. Inflation increased from 60% in 1861 to 300% in 1863 and 600% in 1864. Davis did not seem to grasp the enormity of the problem. In April 1863, food shortages led to rioting in Richmond, as poor people robbed and looted numerous stores for food until Davis cracked down and restored order. Davis feuded bitterly with his vice president. Perhaps even more seriously, he clashed with powerful state governors who used states' rights arguments to withhold their militia units from national service and otherwise blocked mobilization plans. Davis is widely evaluated as a less effective war leader than Lincoln, even though Davis had extensive military experience and Lincoln had little. Davis would have preferred to be an army general and as president tended to manage military matters himself, delegating poorly. Lincoln and Davis led in very different ways. According to one historian, Lincoln was flexible. Davies was rigid. Lincoln wanted to win. Davies wanted to be right. Lincoln had a broad strategic vision of Union goals. Davis could never enlarge his narrow view. Lincoln searched for the right general, then let him fight the war. Davis continuously played favorites and interfered unduly with his generals, even with Robert E. Lee. Lincoln led his nation. Davis failed to rally the South. A Euro William J. Cooper, Jr. There were many factors that led to Union victory over the Confederacy, and Davis recognized from the start that the South was at a distinct disadvantage. But in the end, Lincoln helped to achieve victory, whereas Davis contributed to defeat. Final Days of the Confederacy In March 1865, General Order 14 provided for enlisting slaves into the army, with a promise of freedom for service. The idea had been suggested years earlier, but Davis did not act upon it until late in the war, and very few slaves were enlisted. On April 3, with Union troops under Ulysses S. Grant poised to capture Richmond, Davis escaped to Danville, Virginia, together with the Confederate cabinet leaving on the Richmond and Danville Railroad. Lincoln sat in Davis' Richmond office just 40 hours later. William T. Sutherland turned over his mansion, which served as Grant's temporary residence from April 3 to April 10, 1865. On about April 12, Davis received Robert E. Lee's letter announcing surrender. He issued his last official proclamation as president of the Confederacy, and then went south to Greensboro, North Carolina. After Lee's surrender, a public meeting was held in Shreveport, Louisiana, at which many speakers supported continuation of the war. Plans were developed for the Davis government to flee to Havana, Cuba. There, the leaders would regroup and head to the Confederate-controlled Trans-Mississippi area by way of the Rio Grande. None of these plans was put into practice. On April 14, Lincoln was shot, dying the next day. Davis expressed regret at his death. He later said that he believed Lincoln would have been less harsh with the South than his successor, Andrew Johnson. In the aftermath, Johnson issued a $100,000 reward for the capture of Davis and accused him of helping to plan the assassination. As the Confederate military structure fell into disarray, the search for Davis by Union forces intensified. President Davis met with his Confederate cabinet for the last time on May 5, 1865, in Washington, Georgia, and officially dissolved the Confederate government. The meeting took place at the Heard House, the Georgia Branch Bank building, with 14 officials present. Along with their hand-picked escort led by Given Campbell, Davis and his wife were captured by Union forces on May 10 at Erinville in Owen County, Georgia. It was reported that Davis put his wife's overcoat over his shoulders while fleeing, 
inspiring caricatures that portrayed him as having disguised himself as a woman while trying to avoid capture. But, Davis made no attempt to disguise himself. Mrs. Davis' heavy shawl had been placed on him to protect him from the chilly atmosphere of the early hour of the morning by his slave James H. Johnson, his valet who served Davis during the Civil War. Meanwhile, Davis' belongings continued on the train bound for Cedar Key, Florida. They were first hidden at Senator David Levy Uly's plantation in Florida, then placed in the care of a railroad agent in Waldo. On June 15, 1865, Union soldiers seized Davis' personal baggage from the agent, together with some of the Confederate government's records. A historical marker was erected at this site. Imprisonment On May 19, 1865, Davis was imprisoned in a casemate at Fortress Monroe on the coast of Virginia. Irons were riveted to his ankles at the order of General Nelson Miles who was in charge of the fort. Davies was allowed no visitors, and no books except the Bible. His health began to suffer, and the attending physician warned that the prisoner's life was in danger, but this treatment continued for some months until late autumn when he was finally given better quarters. General Miles was transferred in mid-1866, and Davis' treatment continued to improve. Pope Pius IX, seeing himself a prisoner in the Vatican, after learning that Davis was a prisoner, sent him a portrait inscribed with the Latin words, Benet ad me omnes qui laboratis, a ego reficium vos, dissit dominus, which correspond to Matthew 11:28. Come to me, all ye that labor, and are burdened, and I will refresh you, saith the Lord. A hand-woven crown of thorns associated with the portrait is often said to have been made by the Pope but may have been woven by Davis' wife Varina. Varina and their young daughter Winnie were allowed to join Davis, and the family was eventually given an apartment in the officers' quarters. Davis was indicted for treason while imprisoned. One of his attorneys was ex-Governor Thomas Pratt of Maryland. There was a great deal of discussion in 1865 about bringing treason trials, especially against Jefferson Davis, and there was no consensus in President Johnson's cabinet to do so. There were no treason trials against anyone, as it was felt they would probably would not succeed and would impede reconciliation. After two years of imprisonment, Davis was released on bail of $100,000, which was posted by prominent citizens including Horace Greeley, Cornelius Vanderbilt and Gerrit Smith. Davis went to Montreal, Canada to join his family which had fled there earlier, and lived in Lenoxville, Quebec until 1868 also visiting Cuba and Europe in search of work. Davies remained under indictment until he was released from all liability by the presidential amnesty issued by Johnson on December 25, 1868. Later years In 1869 Davis became president of the Carolina Life Insurance Company in Memphis, Tennessee, where he resided at the Peabody Hotel. Upon General Lee's death in 1870, Davis presided over the memorial meeting in Richmond. Elected to the U.S. Senate again, he was refused the office in 1875, having been barred from federal office by Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. He turned down the opportunity to become the first president of the Agriculture and Mechanical College of Texas. During Reconstruction, Davis publicly remained silent on his opinions. But privately he expressed opinions that federal military rule and Republican authority over former Confederate states was unjustified. He considered Yankee and Negro rule in the South oppressive. Like many of his contemporaries, Davis held the belief that blacks were inferior to whites. The historian William J. Cooper has stated that Davis believed in a Southern social order that included a democratic white polity based firmly on dominance of a controlled and excluded black caste. Ownership of the Breerfield plantation was ensnarled in court cases, with the politics of the state judges playing a key role. Only after the Democrats took control of the state Supreme Court in 1881 did Davis, for the first time in his life, gain legal title. In 1876, Davis promoted a society for the stimulation of U.S. trade with South America. He visited England the next year. In 1877, Sarah Ann Ellis Dorsey, a wealthy widow who had heard of his difficulties, invited him to stay at her estate of Beauvoir in Biloxi, Mississippi. 
she provided him with a cabin for his own use and helped him with his writing through organization, dictation, editing, and encouragement. Knowing she was severely ill, in 1878 Dorsey made over her will, leaving Beauvoir and her financial assets of $50,000 to Jefferson Davis and, in the case of his death, to his only surviving child, Winnie Davis. Dorsey died in 1879, by which time both the Davises and Winnie were living at Beauvoir. Over the next two years, Davis completed the rise and fall of the Confederate government. Davies' reputation among ex-Confederates was restored by the book and by his warm reception on his tour of the region in 1886 and 1887. In numerous stops, he attended last cause ceremonies, where large crowds showered him with affection and local leaders presented emotional speeches honoring his sacrifices to the would-be nation. Such events helped the South come to terms with their defeat and continued for decades after the war. The Meriden Daily Journal stated that Davis, at a reception held in New Orleans in May 1887, urged Southerners to be loyal to the nation. He said, United you are now, and if the Union is ever to be broken, let the other side break it. Davies stated that men in the Confederacy had successfully fought for their own rights with inferior numbers during the Civil War and that the Northern historians ignored this view. Davis firmly believed that Confederate secession was constitutional. The former Confederate president was optimistic concerning American prosperity and the next generation. Davis completed a short history of the Confederate States of America in October 1889. On November 6, he left Beauvoir to visit his plantation at Breerfield. While in New Orleans, he was caught in a sleety rain, and on the steamboat trip upriver, he had a severe cold. On November 13 he left Breerfield to return to New Orleans. Varina Davis, who had taken another boat to Breerfield, met him on the river, and he finally received some medical care. Two doctors came aboard further south and found him to be suffering from acute bronchitis complicated by malaria. They arrived in New Orleans three days later, and he was taken to the home of Charles Erasmus Venner, an associate justice of the Louisiana Supreme Court. Davies remained in bed but was stable for the next two weeks. However, he took a turn for the worse in early December. Just when he appeared to be improving, he lost consciousness on the evening of December 5 and died at age 81 at 12.45 a.m. on Friday, December 6, 1889, in the presence of several friends and with his hand in Varina's. His funeral was one of the largest in the South. Davies was first entombed at the Army of Northern Virginia tomb at Muteri Cemetery in New Orleans. In 1893, Mrs. Davis decided to have his remains reinterred at Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond. After the remains were exhumed in New Orleans, they lay for a day at Memorial Hall of the newly organized Louisiana Historical Association, with many mourners passing by the casket, including Governor Murphy J. Foster, Sr. The body was placed on a Louisville and Nashville railroad car and transported to Richmond. A continuous court at GE, day and night, accompanied his body from New Orleans to Richmond. He is interred at Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond beneath a life-sized statue. Legacy Jefferson Davis served in many roles. As a soldier, he was brave and resourceful. As a politician, he served as a United States Senator and a Mississippi Congressman and was active and accomplished, although he never completed a full term in any elected position. As a plantation owner, he employed slave labor as did most of his peers in the South, and supported slavery. As President of the Confederate States of America, he is widely viewed as an ineffective wartime leader. Although the task of defending the Confederacy against the much stronger Union would have been a great challenge for any leader, to visa Euro unregistered trademark performance in this role is considered poor. After the war, he contributed to reconciliation of the South with the North, but remained a symbol for Southern pride. Numerous memorials to Jefferson Davis were created. The largest is the 351-foot concrete obelisk located at the Jefferson Davis State Historic Site in Fairview, Kentucky, marking his birthplace. Construction of the monument began in 1917 and finished in 1924 at a cost of about $200,000. In 1913, 
the United Daughters of the Confederacy conceived the Jefferson Davis Memorial Highway, a transcontinental highway to be built through the South. Portions of the highway's route in Virginia, Alabama and other states still bear the name of Jefferson Davis. Davis appeared on several postage stamps issued by the Confederacy, including its first postage stamp. In 1995, his portrait appeared on a United States postage stamp, part of a series of 20 stamps commemorating the 130th anniversary of end of the Civil War. Davies was also celebrated on the Six Cent Stone Mountain Memorial Carving Commemorative on September 19, 1970, at Stone Mountain, Georgia. The stamp portrayed Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee and Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson on horseback. It depicts a replica of the actual memorial, carved into the side of Stone Mountain at 400 feet above ground level, the largest high-relief sculpture in the world. The Jefferson Davis Presidential Library was established at Beauvoir in 1998. For some years, the white columned by Loxy Mansion that was Davis' final home had served as a Confederate veteran's home. The house and library were damaged by Hurricane Katrina in 2005. The house reopened in 2008. Bertram Hayes Davis, Davis' great-great-grandson, is the executive director of Beauvoir which is owned by the Mississippi Division of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Based at Rice University in Houston, Texas, the Papers of Jefferson Davis is an editing project to publish documents related to Davis. Since the early 1960s, it has published 13 volumes, the first in 1971 and the most recent in 2012. Two more volumes are planned. The project has roughly 100,000 documents in its archives. The birthday of Jefferson Davis is commemorated in several states. His actual birthday, June 3, is celebrated in Florida, Kentucky, Louisiana and Tennessee. In Alabama, it is celebrated on the first Monday in June. In Mississippi, the last Monday of May is celebrated as National Memorial Day and Jefferson Davis' birthday. In Texas, Confederate Heroes Day is celebrated on January 19, the birthday of Robert E. Lee. Jefferson Davis' birthday had been officially celebrated on June 3 but was combined with Lee's birthday in 1973. Some memorials to Davis have become controversial. Washington State Route 99 bears the name of Jefferson Davis Highway. In 2002, the state's House of Representatives unanimously approved a bill that would have removed Davis' name from the road. However, a committee of the state's Senate subsequently killed the proposal. In the former Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia, the Museum of the Confederacy was involved in a controversy regarding a statue of Davis donated by the Sons of Confederate Veterans in 2008. Likewise, a statue of Abraham Lincoln, donated to the Civil War Visitor Center in Richmond in 2003, resulted in protests. In 2011, the County Board of Arlington County, Virginia, voted to change the name of Old Jefferson Davis Highway, the original route of Jefferson Davis Highway in the county, after the board's chairman made disparaging remarks about Davis. However, the name of Jefferson Davis Highway itself, a portion of U.S. 1 that only the Virginia General Assembly could rename, remained unchanged. Robert E. Lee's United States citizenship was posthumously restored in 1975. Jefferson Davis had been specifically excluded from earlier resolutions restoring rights to other Confederate officials, and a movement arose to restore Davis' citizenship as well. This was accomplished with the passing of Senate Joint Resolution 16 on October 17, 1978. In signing the law, President Jimmy Carter referred to this as the last act of reconciliation in the Civil War. See also, List of Memorials to Jefferson Davis, References Bibliography, Allon, Felicity. Jefferson Davis, Unconquerable Heart. Columbia, The University of Missouri Press. ISBN 9780826212191. Ballard, Michael B. A. Long Shadow, Jefferson Davis in the Final Days of the Confederacy. Jackson, University Press of Mississippi. ISBN 9780820319414. Collins, 
Donald E. The Death and Resurrection of Jefferson Davis Lanham Maryland, Roman and Littlefield Publishers. ISBN 9780742543041. Cooper, William J. Jefferson Davis, American. New York, Alfred A. Noth. ISBN 9780307772640. Cooper, William J. Jefferson Davis and the Civil War Era. Baton Rouge, Louisiana State University Press. ISBN 9780807153116. Current, Richard, A. L. Encyclopedia of the Confederacy. New York, Simon & Schuster. Coulter, Ellis Merton. The Confederate States of America, 1861 Euro 1865, Volume 7. Baton Rouge, Louisiana State University Press. ISBN A 9780807100073 David A. Davis, William C. Davis, William C. Jefferson Davis, The Man and His Hour. Louisiana State University Press. ISBN 9780807120798. Dodd, William E. Jefferson Davis. Philadelphia, George W. Jacobs and Company. Eaton, Clement. Jefferson Davis. New York, The Free Press. Escott, Paul. After Secession, Jefferson Davis and the Failure of Confederate Nationalism. Baton Rouge. Louisiana State University Press. ISBN 9780807118078. Hathaway, Herman and Beringer, Richard E. Jefferson Davis, Confederate President. Lawrence, University Press of Kansas. ISBN 9780700611706. McPherson, James M. Battlecry of Freedom, The Civil War Era. New York, Bantam Books. ISBN 9780195038637. Naley J. R., Mark E. Confederate Bastille, Jefferson Davis and Civil Liberties. Milwaukee, Marquette University Press. ISBN 9780874623253. Patrick, Rembert W. Jefferson Davis and His Cabinet. Baton Rouge, Louisiana State University Press. Rabel, George C. The Confederate Republic, A Revolution Against Politics. Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina Press. ISBN 9780807863961. Stoker, Donald, There Was No Offensive Defensive Confederate Strategy, Journal of Military History, 73, 571 Euro 90. Strode, Hudson. Jefferson Davis, Volume I, American Patriot. New York, Harcourt, Brace and Company. Strode, Hudson. Jefferson Davis, Volume 2, Confederate President. New York, Harcourt, Brace and Company. Strode, Hudson. Jefferson Davis, Volume 3, Tragic Hero. New York, Harcourt, Brace and Company. Swanson, James L. Bloody Crimes, The Chase for Jefferson Davis and the Death Pageant for Lincoln's Corpse. New York, HarperCollins. ISBN 9780061233791. Thomas, Emory M. The Confederate Nation, 1861 Euro 1865. New York, Harper and Row. ISBN 9780062069467. Woodworth, Stephen E. Jefferson Davis and His Generals. The Failure of Confederate Command in the West. Lawrence, University Press of Kansas. ISBN A 9780700604606. Primary Sources, Davis, Jefferson. Cooper, J.R., William J., ed. Jefferson Davis, The Essential Writings A, Davis, 
Jefferson. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government A. Roland, Dunbar, Ed Jefferson Davis, Constitutionalist, His Letters, Papers, and Speeches. Jackson, Mississippi Department of Archives and History A. Monroe, J.R. Haskell M. McIntosh, James T. Christ, Linda L., Ed's The Papers of Jefferson Davis. Louisiana State University Press. External links, Jefferson Davis in Encyclopedia Virginia, Jefferson Davis Final Resting Place, works by Jefferson Davis at Project Gutenberg, Jefferson Davis at the Biographical Directory of the United States Congress, Booknotes Interview with William Cooper on Jefferson Davis, American, April 8, 2001.